On this Pentecost Sunday, we pause a moment to prepare ourselves for worship and invite the Holy Spirit into our hearts. We invite you to join us in the call to worship. Come Holy Spirit. Spirit of the living God, visit us again on this day of Pentecost. Come, Come Holy, Holy Spirit. Spirit. Like a rushing wind that sweeps away all barriers. Come, Come Holy, Holy Spirit. Spirit. Like tongues of fire that set our hearts aflame. Come Holy Spirit. With speech that unites the babble of our tongues. Come Holy Spirit. With love that overlaps the boundaries of race and nation. Come Holy Spirit. With power from above to make our weakness strong. Come Holy Spirit. Come Holy Spirit, renew the whole creation. Send the wind and flame of your transforming life to lift up the church in this day. Give us wisdom and faith that we may know the great hope to which we are called. Come, Come Holy, Holy Spirit. Spirit. Spirit of truth, set us free to emerge as the children of God. Open our ears that we may hear the weeping of the world. Open our mouths, that we may be a voice for the voiceless. Open our eyes, that we may see your vision of peace and justice. Make us alive with the courage and faith of your prophetic truth. Come, Come Holy, Holy Spirit. Spirit of unity, reconcile to your people. Give us the wisdom to hold to what we need to be your church. Give us the grace to lay down those things you can do without. Give us a vision of your breadth and length and height to challenge our smallness of heart and bring us humbly together. Come, Come Holy, Holy Spirit. Spirit. Holy Spirit, transform and sanctify us as we take up this task in your name. Give us the gifts we need to be your church in spirit and truth. Come, Holy Spirit. Amen. Come, Holy Spirit, come. Well, good morning, and welcome to First United Methodist Church Richardson. Welcome to our modern service. Uh, we are overjoyed to have you this morning to be worshiping with you wherever you are as the body of Christ this day. And our prayer today is that wherever you are, that the Holy Spirit would come into the temple of your hearts and move you and transform you today. We want to begin by singing a song that welcomes the Spirit into our hearts. Won't you sing with us? There's nothing worth more that will ever come close. Nothing can compare your I living home. Your presence, Lord. I've tasted and seen. Sweetest of love 
that just makes the Holy Spirit just feel so much more accessible and uh, really help me feel the presence of God. And I really hope that y'all feel that when you're worshiping. I think that this Pentecost season is one of those seasons where the Holy Spirit just makes itself feel known. And so I hope that you can continue to open yourselves up to that and also to just welcome it in, whether it's through your worship or in your daily lives. Uh, I am Shandon Klein, and I'm so excited to welcome you to our modern worship service here through First United Methodist Church Richardson, where we welcome people for Christ, grow people in Christ, and serve people with Christ. If you're new, you're worshiping with us. We're so excited that you're here. Um, and we also want to know that you specifically were watching us today. So one way to do that and help us out is to text the word new to the phone number 972-235-8385 and just follow through the prompts that get text back to you. Um, also, if you've never let us know that you've been worshiping with us, this is a great time to go ahead and text the word new to that phone number as well. Again, we'd love to connect with you and see how we could be praying for you uh, during the week. Also, if you're not new, uh, you know the drill. You can click on the button above and check in there, or you can click on the link below that is in the Facebook Live comments, or you can go onto the FUMCR app to check in through Fellowship One. Uh, either way that you do it, uh, it's a way to help us stay that body of Christ in faith. Uh, before we move on to the rest of our worship service, we have a special message from our Bishop of the North Texas Conference, Bishop Mike McKee. Let's take a listen. Hello, I'm Mike McKee, the Bishop of the North Texas Conference of the United Methodist Church. Today is Pentecost Sunday, and I'm standing in the sanctuary of St. Andrew United Methodist Church, which is where we were scheduled to have this year's annual conference on this day, on Pentecost. I want to come here and just sort of send some greetings to all of the clergy and laity of the North Texas Conference to thank you for the ministry in which you have done over the last 12 weeks. And yes, it's been that long since we've been gathering in churches. Thank you for your ministry. Thank you for the way you've reached out to the communities. And I know that it's been difficult and challenging. I know many of you want to return to your church and we'll be able to do that at some time and some will come sooner than others. But even that will come with some difficulty. But I know that you're faithful enough to do it in a way in which no one has any harm inflicted upon them. I want you to know also that we're not going to go back and think things are going to be like they were. I hope that what's happened is a rekindling of the Spirit, the Holy Spirit among us in such a way that will heed the cry of the prophet Joel. The prophet Joel, who Peter quoted on Pentecost Day, that first Pentecost, that young men and young women shall see visions, and old men and old women shall dream dreams. I hope you've caught both a vision and a dream of the future of what the church can be and how we can be in deeper and broader and more inspiring ministry to the people in our communities. So thank you. Thank you for your faithfulness. Thank you for your continued support of ministry. And may God bless you. Thank you, Bishop McKee, for your word of encouragement and your words for us on this very special Pentecost Day. I'm Cheryl Bishop, Director of Worship and Children's Ministries here at First United Methodist Church Richardson, and uh, I've gathered together some very special friends for children's time today. I hope that you'll see all the different kinds of bears that are here. I have bears from all over the world. I have teddy bears, and I have Winnie the Pooh, and I have a polar bear, and a koala bear, and we are together celebrating the birthday of the church. And so as we hear the story of Pentecost, it reminds us of the day that people were gathered together after Jesus had died and risen, and they were gathered together from all over the world, 
in one place and the Holy Spirit swept through the room. There was a rush of a mighty wind and tongues of fire danced on everyone's heads. And they began to speak languages that they didn't know before and understand languages that they'd never heard before. And it was a time when they were reminded that through the power of the Holy Spirit, that the church would grow. That because of them, and all that they had experienced and all that they would tell people that the church would continue to grow and they would make disciples of other people and they would baptize people of all nations and races. And that is the birth of the church that we continue to experience today. And so on the count of three, I'd love for all of you to say happy birthday church with me. Are you ready? One, two, three. Happy birthday church. It's a special day for us to be reminded of the power of the Holy Spirit, the awesomeness of God, and the love of Jesus Christ, and that we get to have a part in that story by telling others about God and Jesus and feeling the Holy Spirit at different times in our lives. And so as we go forward from today, I pray that you will celebrate the birth of the church over and over again, and that you will help spread the word about Jesus' love to others that you meet. Let's pray. Awesome God, thank you for your church who teaches us your word and about Jesus' love. We love you, God. Thank you for loving us. Amen. The birth of the church thousands of years ago continues through the ministries of First United Methodist Church Richardson. And so you are invited to be a part of that. You can text to give or you can give online but I pray that you will find ways to support the ministry so that we can continue to be the church that the Holy Spirit breathed life into all those years ago.
beautiful prayer. I love the covenant prayer by John Wesley. I am no longer my own. Put me to whatever you will. I am yours and you are mine. I'm Paviel Jenkins, one of the associate pastors, and I invite you into a time of prayer. God of wind and flame, come like a fire and burn in us. Ignite the fire of hope, fan the flames of possibility. Transform us into a people who share your love with the world in pain. A people who proclaim your hope, a people who live as though the world can be changed into the kingdom that is to come. God of many languages, you sing the language of joy with us. Hear your children who sing and dance with praise, those who celebrate new life and all the possibilities of the future, those for whom the wonder of life fills their being. Oh God, hear your children who wail, those who find themselves in hospital beds, at gravesides, who worry where the next meal or paycheck will come from. God of Pentecost, you make yourself known in many ways. Come like a fire and burn in us this and every day. Hear the prayers we share in our different languages and give us courage to speak your love wherever we go to everyone we meet. We pray this in the name of Jesus Christ who taught us to pray. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We are blessed to have two ministry interns with us this summer. One of them is Nathan Lewis, who is a student at UT Austin, and he returns to us this summer as he continues to explore his call to ministry. We welcome Nathan as he reads our scripture today. Thank you, Paviel. Uh, hello, my name is Nathan Lewis. Uh, if you have your Bible with you, whether that be hard copy or on an app on your phone, um, I would just ask that you turn to our scripture reading for today, Acts 2, verses 1 through 13. When the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place. And suddenly from heaven there came a sound like the rush of a violent wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. Divided tons as a fire appeared among them, and a ton rested on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages as the Spirit gave them ability. Now there were devout Jews from every nation under heaven living in Jerusalem. And at this sound, the crowd gathered and was bewildered, because each one heard them speaking in the native language of each. Amazed and astonished, they asked, Are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear each of us in our own native language? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt, and other parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene, and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs, in our own languages, we hear them speaking about God's deeds of power. All were amazed and perplexed, saying to another, what does this mean? But others sneered and said, they are filled with new wine. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Nathan, for reading our scripture this morning. It is so, so good to have you on the team here at First United Methodist Church Richardson for the summer. Uh, and my name is Josh Fitzpatrick. I am the lead pastor of our modern worship service here. And I just want to thank you for joining us here this morning. I, I want to start off by asking you a question. Have you ever jumped into a situation and immediately upon entering, you realized that, that you just kind of fell out of context Maybe you've, uh, you've gone to a Halloween party dressed up as a superhero and as soon as you walk in the door, you realize that you were the only person who dressed up, that, that you didn't get a memo that, that it wasn't a costume party. Or, or maybe you've, uh, you've experienced the first day on a job and you, you find yourself in your office or wherever it is and, and everybody is just working like they own the place and you look around 
overwhelmed and, and a little disoriented going, I- I'm not sure I, I belong here. Or, or perhaps you've, you've traveled to a foreign country and as you've walked around, you realize that everybody is speaking a different language and you don't understand anything that they're saying. That exact thing happened to me 10 years ago when we moved from California to Texas. <laughs> and, and there were numerous occasions when I found myself going, I, I think that people here are speaking a language that I, I don't understand. In fact, one of my first experiences with the man named Steve, who was one of my first friends in Texas and still remains one of my best friends here. I remember when he was telling me a story about these couts in his backyard and how they were dangerous for, for his small dogs. And I had to pause and think to myself, what is he saying? Couts. I think he's saying, is he saying cows? I, don't, I couldn't understand how a cow would be dangerous to his small dogs, but, but I mean, this was Texas. Maybe I didn't, I didn't understand cows in Texas and perhaps they were dangerous to small dogs in, in this, what I considered at that time, a, a foreign land. And it, it took me a while to recognize that, that what Steve was telling me was that he was using a, a one, he was using one syllable, count, to uh, describe a, a three-syllable word, which was, coyote and for me from California always having said coyote here my my new best friend Steve say those cows in my backyard it was like a, a foreign language uh, it was hilarious at the time now I also recognize that I am so indebted to Steve because that was the beginning of our journey together where he taught me all sorts of things about this new land I found myself in taught me about tornadoes taught me about this unique clay soil in North Texas uh, he taught me about Oak Cliff, where he was born and grew up, and about all the great things in, in Dallas that came from Oak Cliff. He taught me about the difference between barbecuing and grilling, which in California were the same thing to me, but, but here they are, are different things. And, and you can't have G's on the end of those words, barbecuing and grilling. He taught me all sorts of things about this, this new land that I was living in. And I'm indebted to Steve. Because I often found myself thinking, what would I do without a translator in this situation? Now, of course, I'm, I'm exaggerating a little bit, but I, I found myself sometimes thinking to myself, you know what, I really am living uh, in the unknown. Now, like I mentioned last week, I don't know about you, but that phrase, into the unknown, it, it might just uh, have a simple, straightforward meaning to you. But for those of us who have seen Frozen 2, when you hear that phrase, into the unknown, the the song immediately goes into your head. Into the unknown, and it just sticks in your head. It's one of those songs that, it's a good song, but you can hear it maybe a a little too much, particularly in our family when when Frozen 2 is watched very, very regularly. It's just like Let It Go from the first Frozen. It's a a popular song, a hit song sung by Elsa, but when it gets in there, it sticks in there. And so earlier this week, I, I asked my, my girls, I said, what does that song mean? What's happening in the movie when, when they say that, into the unknown? And, and Emily, I love, she said, so that's the part of the movie where Elsa is hearing this voice calling her to go into a place that she's never been before, and she can't decide what to do because half of her wants to trust the voice and go into the unknown, but the other half of her is really scared and doesn't want to go. And I was like, bingo, that's it, right? I mean, how applicable is that to our lives today? On numerous occasions, how many times are we stuck between hearing this voice that is leading us into the unknown and and having this sense of inner tension between do I trust the voice and go forward or am I scared and stay back? And so whether it's, it's moving from California to Texas into this unknown territory and, and having a voice of reason that, that can act as a translator, if you will, or it's just trying to figure out what life is like in the midst of a pandemic, trying to figure out what the, our new reality is and, and what's up and what's down and, and what day of the week it even is, The question is, do we trust the voice that leads us? 
on a daily basis as we are led into the unknown, do we trust the voice that leads us? Now, as we enter into the unknown book of Acts, I shouldn't say it's an unknown book. It's a, it's a book that I'm excited to study because it's a book of the Bible that, that really has deep parallels to, to what we're going through today. Questions that we're asking are the same questions that the early church asked of, oh, what is the church? What is our mission? What are we doing? What is our purpose? And how do we fulfill that purpose? I'm excited to, to jump right into Acts chapter 2 on this day of Pentecost. Now, the day of Pentecost is a day that we celebrate every year, just like, like we would read the story of Christmas on an annual basis, and we would read the story of Easter on an annual basis. Here in the United Methodist Church, we read the story of Pentecost on an annual basis as a reminder of God's activity in the world, this arrival of the Holy Spirit that you heard Nathan just read about here in Acts chapter 2. But one of the things I think we need to clarify before we dive into it any further is that the day of Pentecost was not always the day of Pentecost from Acts chapter 2. You see, in the 21st century, as Christians, we look back when we say the day of Pentecost, this is the picture that comes to mind. But for first century Jews, the day of Pentecost was something that had a much, much deeper history. So Pentecost was a, a part of the Jewish calendar. There were several different festivals that, that commemorated different things within the life of the people of God. Now, Passover, if you remember, Passover was this festival that, that celebrated God's deliverance of God's people as the Spirit of God passed over the doors and the households of, of the Jewish people and spared the Jewish children as they were in Egypt, and which eventually led to their escape out of Egypt. And 50 days after Passover, the Jewish people would celebrate Pentecost. Now, 50 days after that original Passover event, the people of Israel found themselves wandering in the desert. And this was the time when Moses ascended Mount Sinai. He received the tablets from God and came back down and delivered the law to the people of God. This was 50 days after Passover. It was the, the Penta. This was Pentecost. And so as the Jewish people would celebrate Pentecost, this deliverance of the law, they would bring their, their first fruits of the harvest to, to God. It was a way of, of commemorating this day that, that they would bring the first fruits in anticipation of the rest of the harvest that would, that would come. This, this marked the beginning of the harvest. And so you have all these different celebrations already in place and we follow this, this tradition on into the New Testament. And in the New Testament, if you recall, as we talked about over the, um, the past few weeks as we led up to Easter, Jesus sat with his disciples and shared a Passover meal. This was the Last Supper. This was the institution of the sacrament of communion. It's not called Passover because of what happened at the Last Supper, but what happened at the Last Supper was a celebration of something the Jewish people had been doing for generations. And so 50 days after Passover, after that Last Supper, after Jesus had been killed, he died, he, he was resurrected, and he ascended into heaven. And 50 days later, Jesus' disciples gather again, and we have this story here in Acts chapter 2. When the arrival of the Holy Spirit just, just comes upon them in this mighty, rushing wind, I love this language that suddenly from heaven there came a sound like a rush of a violent wind and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. Now, I don't know about you, but when I read this story, I, I have several different images that come to mind and one of them's a pretty recent one. We, uh, we have this tradition in Emily's school where we do a daddy-daughter camp out twice a year. So there's one in the spring and there's one in the fall. And this past fall, when we went on the camp out, there was a burn ban. And so one of our favorite parts of camping out, we weren't allowed to do. We weren't allowed to, to sit around and set up our, our chairs around the campfire and, and enjoy a good time around the campfire because there was a burn ban. And so one of the dads in the group, he, he owns a flight school and he's got all this aviation equipment. And so he volunteered to bring these massive heaters that they use to help de-ice their planes in the winter. I mean, this thing was like... It was like a cannon on wheels. It looked like a jet engine in and of itself. And so he brought those and, and set up two of those, one on each side of the campfire area. And so here we are sitting in our little chairs around this nice peaceful campfire that can't be lit. And he fires these things up. And 
I kid you not, the entire campground could hear these things from like miles away. They just went, as they like warmed up and they were going full capacity. I felt like if you strapped that thing to the back of my car, it could have become a jet. Not really because it was just a heater, but the, the sound and the power of those things, all I could think of in that moment was, was Pentecost as we tried to like yell at each other over this campfire that, that wasn't even burning. It, it was a pretty surreal scene, but I mean, it worked. At least it, it kept us warm in that moment. But it reminded me of this, this sound of this, this rushing wind, like, like a tornado or, or like a hurricane, the, the rush of a violent wind. It filled the entire house in which they were sitting. And then as the Holy Spirit descends onto that place, these, these tongues of fire appear. And, and I, I like this imagery because I remember a, a professor in undergrad telling me about the book of Revelation, saying when we talk about the book of Revelation, we're, we're talking about a dream. And this is, this is humanity's best attempt at describing heavenly imagery as if you were trying to describe your own dream. And so it's the same type of thing here. Were there, were there actual flames? I don't know, but, but this is the image that the author uses to describe what happened. Just like we would try to find some sort of familiar imagery to describe some surreal experience that we've had. And so these tongues that, that were like, like flames of fire came and rested on each one of them. And as the Holy Spirit rested in that room, they began to speak different languages. As they experience this whole thing together, this, this massive sound and, and these tongues of fire and this, these languages that they began to speak that they didn't previously know, it drew the attention of the crowds around and they began to gather and observe what was happening in that place. And as they gathered, it said that Jews from all over the world, Jews that spoke different languages began to understand those who had received the Holy Spirit in their own language. You see, this was a result of the diaspora. We talked about last week, 586 BC, the Babylonians, they come in, they, they destroy the temple, the Jewish people are kicked out of, out of the holy land, their, their promised land, they're kicked out and they're spread all over the world. And so this has implications that last for generations and here in Acts chapter 2 we see an example of Jewish people from all over the world who now speak different languages brought together into one place and are able to understand one another because of the power of the Holy Spirit. And then I've always loved verses 12 and 13, the, the response to what happens here. Verse 12 says, all were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, what does this mean? But others sneered and said they are filled with new wine. In other words, there are one, or one of two reactions. Some people look at what just happened and went, wow. That's amazing. What does this mean? There's this sense of anticipation. But for others, there was this sense of, of skepticism. The sense that, that maybe they're not okay. A sense that, that these people are, are not acting normal, if you will. And so I want to go back to the question that that I started with here and say that as these earliest believers in Jesus were, were doing their best to follow Jesus and after Jesus had ascended into heaven and they anticipate the arrival of the Holy Spirit, they're experiencing everything together. Do they trust the voice that leads them into this unknown land? One of the reasons I love this story so much is because of the parallels. There are multiple parallels between the Old Testament and the New Testament here in this story. And one of those parallels is this. Think about it. When Moses ascended Mount Sinai and brought down the tablets, the law of God to the people of God, on the day of Pentecost, this original 50 days after Passover, here in the New Testament, we have Jesus who has ascended into heaven and we have the arrival of the Holy Spirit the one who would write the law of God on the hearts of all believers. You see this parallel. Another parallel that I love is this idea of the first fruits. That as the Jewish people would celebrate this, this festival, the festival of first fruits that commemorated this, this day of Pentecost, they would do so in anticipation of the harvest that was to come. 
They would bring their first fruits to God, recognizing that this was just the beginning of great things to come. Likewise, in parallel fashion, on this day of Pentecost, we find in Acts chapter 2, we see the first fruits of this new movement of the kingdom of God in the world. First fruits that, that signal the promise of good things to come, of the beginning of an expansion of God's people, of God's kingdom, of, of this movement that would change the world forever. In fact, we talk about the day of Pentecost being the birthday of the church, the beginning of life of this new movement in and through the person of Jesus Christ. And then the third parallel is, is perhaps my favorite. It's one that I, I talked about more in depth last May on last year's day of Pentecost. And it's the parallel between what happens here in Acts chapter 2 and what happened with the Tower of Babel in Genesis chapter 11. And without going into too much detail about, about the Tower of Babel in, in Genesis chapter 11, in, in essence what happened was that the people got prideful and at that point they all, they all spoke one language and they gathered together and they, they thought they were going to build a tower that would reach the heavens. We are such a great and mighty people. We're going we're gonna to build this tower to reach the heavens and that, that upset God. And so God at that time divided their languages and sent them all over the world so that they couldn't understand each other. So that it would disrupt the effectiveness of their ability to work together. And so what we see here in Acts chapter 2 is really the reversal of what happened in Genesis chapter 11. If at the Tower of Babel God divided their languages so that they couldn't work together, in Acts chapter 2 with the arrival of the Holy Spirit, God unifies their languages so that they can understand each other so that they can work together as they begin this movement into this world. In essence, God was de the world. Now, don't use that in any sort of deep, theological conversation because that's just a word that I made up but but I think it gets to the point as a reminder that God is in the business of redemption and here in Acts chapter 2 God is bringing together these people who are so divided and unifying them and de so that they can fulfill God's mission in the world. Okay, so we have each of these three parallels. We've got, we've got Moses who has ascended and brought down the law, paralleled to Jesus who has ascended into heaven and brought the Holy Spirit to write God's law on the hearts of those who believe. And then we've got the parallel of the first fruits that, that the Jewish people would bring the first fruits to, to commemorate and signal the beginning of the harvest in the same fashion. The day of Pentecost is a sign of the first fruits of what it is to come as we anticipate God's movement into the future. And then we've got this Tower of Babel as the reversal of what happened in Genesis 11. God de the world and unifies us through the power of the Holy Spirit so that we can understand each other and be effective in fulfilling God's mission in the world. And we come to a point where we ask, well, what does this have to do with me? And again, I want to come back to that question that I asked at the beginning. As we are led into the unknown... Do we trust the voice that leads us? As we travel into unknown territory, do we trust the voice that leads us? And I want to say that if we do, I want to point out three potential results. If we trust the voice that leads us into the unknown, the first potential result is this. People will look at us and say, are they okay? Are they okay right now? Because they're doing things and making decisions that are more bold and courageous than I have ever seen them make. They are doing things that, that I have never expected them to do. They must have experienced something that I don't know about. When was the last time our church has experienced the power of the Holy Spirit in such a way that those on the outside looking in are forced to ask, are they okay? When was the last time you allowed God to affect your life in such a way that you found yourself doing things that you had never previously done? And it doesn't have to be huge, world-changing things. It can be volunteering on a regular basis. It can be perhaps writing a check to some nonprofit organization. It could be speaking to your spouse or to your kids with new grace and patience 
Whatever it is, have you allowed the spirit of the Lord to change your life in such a way that those on the outside looking in look at you and say, are you okay? That's potential result number one. Number two, as we travel into the unknown, if we trust the voice that leads us, we'll have a sense of anticipation of the days that lie ahead. Just like this idea of the first fruits of the Spirit and the, the birthplace of the church as these earliest followers were, in, just, were, were engulfed by the Holy Spirit, there was this, anticip, this sense of anticipation asking, what does this mean? As we'll see over the course of this sermon series, the days that lie ahead are, are exciting days. And if we today trust the Holy Spirit, we too can have this sense of anticipation that there are exciting days ahead of us, that there are great days ahead of us, that we right now are experiencing the first fruits of the Spirit that are a promise of what is still yet to come. But the only reason that we can have that hope and trust in that excitement in this world is because of what I would say is result number three, is that as we go into the unknown and we trust the voice that leads us, we trust that voice because we know that the power of the Holy Spirit that arrived on this day is the same power of the Holy Spirit that, that created the entire universe, is the same power of the Holy Spirit that speaks to us today and invites us into this mission to de the world around us. Let me say it another way. The only reason that we can hope and anticipate the good days that are to come in the midst of a world that just does not make sense is because we know we can trust in the power of the Holy Spirit and the power of God in this mission of redemption. We know we serve a God who turns wrongs into rights. We serve a God of justice we serve a God who calls us and invites us into this mission of unification when the world is so, so divided. And so the third result of trusting the voice that leads us is that we have the opportunity to be invited into this project of de the world around us. So, as we go into the unknown, do we trust the voice that leads us? If so, we can experience life in such a way that those watching will ask us, are you okay? If so, then we have the opportunity to anticipate good days ahead. And if so, then we also have the opportunity to enter into this story of God, this mission of redemption, this invitation to bring unity to a world that is so, so divided. And so whether you're moving from, from California to Texas <laughs> or you're just living in the year 2020 and asking yourself, what in the world is going on in the world. May we have the courage to trust the voice that empowers us, that gives us courage, and that leads us. The power of the Holy Spirit. Amen? Amen. Would you join us as we sing this final song, Spirit of the Living God.
Spirit of the living God, you are changing everything. Do you believe those words? Because if we do trust the voice that leads us into the unknown, then we open ourselves up to being changed by the power of the Holy Spirit.
Hey, thanks again for joining us today for worship here in the modern service at First United Methodist Church Richardson. As always, I want to invite you to email me personally if you have any questions about anything we do here, anything that, that you've experienced in this service today. If you have any questions perhaps about joining our church or, or about how Jesus can change your life, would you please email me at josh at fumcr.com. I also at this time want to invite you to check in for change. Check in for change is an initiative that we've been doing for several months now. Now. And over the course of these past several months, we've been able to, to uh, make small donations to a variety of nonprofits here locally, uh, helping agencies serving Richardson. We've been able to make donations to the Inclusion, Diversity, and Equity Foundation at Richardson Independent School District. We've been able to partner with Network of Community Ministries this month. As, as you know, you've been hearing about over the past several weeks, we've been able to make donations to the Counseling Place, to, to Heifer International, just to a variety of different different nonprofit organizations and and there's two benefits to it one we get to to sponsor those nonprofits and, and bring attention to the great work that they're doing in the world but we also by checking in for change Every time we get to check in on Facebook, we invite those who are watching our Facebook to see what God is doing here in and through the people of First United Methodist Church Richardson. And so I want to continue to encourage you to check in for change on a regular basis. And again, just that is simply checking in to our church on Facebook. You're welcome to, to post a picture or whatever you want just to, to check in. And for every check in on Facebook, we make a small donation to a local nonprofit. And so again, this month, that this is the, the last week of May, we are making those small donations to Network of Community Ministries. And those small donations add up. I want to invite you to be a part of that initiative, Check In for Change. Now, would you receive this benediction? May the God who created you and knows you better than you know yourself remind you of your sacred worth as a child of God. And may God give us the courage to open ourselves up to the incredible life-transforming change that God desires to do in each one of us so that we might invite the Holy Spirit into our lives to change us from the inside out so that those who are watching will look at us and say, are they okay? May we have that type of courage as we go from this place today knowing that the Spirit of the living God is in this place Wherever this place is for you today, know that God wants to empower you to make a difference in this world. Amen? Amen. Go in peace and have a great week. Hey, thanks again for worshiping with us today. I want to take just a second and tell you about something that's exciting this weekend. As we are welcoming 75 or 80, even more members into our church family this weekend. And that is primarily because of something that we call confirmation. Now, in the Methodist Church, we believe that the process of faith development is a lifelong process. And so we, we practice infant baptism as we welcome you into the family, but that also includes a process where in our church, when you are in the sixth grade, you go through a very concentrated year of learning about the basic tenets of the Christian faith. And at the end of that year, you have an opportunity to publicly profess your faith, to make it your own, we say. Uh, and it's at that point also that we welcome you into our church membership uh, in an official kind of adult uh, manner. And so this weekend, this Pentecost weekend, we have all of our confirmation students participating in, in a creative, uh, safely distanced confirmation service uh, that will take place by our Jesus statue in the Walk With Me garden. And I just want to take a second, not just to tell you about them, but to also to say congratulations to them. Uh, this is a huge, huge decision in your life. And so we are so, so proud of you. And we just want to say welcome to the family.